This testing theater almost broke me, but it's finally finished. And it's all that I hoped it would be. Welcome friends, newcomers, and audiophiles alike. If you're unaware, I had been working on this testing home theater for a solid four months, and last week I put the final touches on it. It's not the prettiest testing space, and that was by design, but man, does it sound incredible. First off though, I have something to confess. In my last video about acoustic panels, I might have completely forgotten to mention that I also put down some carpet tiles so that sound wouldn't be bouncing off a concrete floor. With that being said though, the acoustic panels did make the biggest difference in the end, but the overall acoustic qualities of this room were definitely helped by having carpet down there. If you're wanting to build your own DIY home theater at some point, carpet or rugs are a must along with the aid of acoustic panels. Now that it's summertime, I need to figure out air conditioning in this place. Uh. So getting back to where we left off, after having made the acoustic panels, I needed to address one major issue with the grow shed. When I had nothing in there, no panels, no carpet, just an echo chamber, I plugged in some equipment to try and test just how awful the acoustics were. But as I was hooking up an audio interface and a powered monitor, I got a low level shock when I stuck a TRS cable into the audio interface. And I could feel some current going through the metal surface on the back of the powered monitor. Uh oh. That's not good. So even though the budget on this project was already ballooning past what I thought it would be, I knew I needed a professional electrician to check out the situation, since I would be reviewing expensive equipment that I don't own and would need to eventually send back. So lo and behold, two of the outlets that I had wired had some issues. So that's on me. But the other huge issue was that the shed's electrical panel itself was not grounded. Like, at all. Hell no, I'm not gonna plug in somebody else's equipment, cross my fingers, and hope for the best that it doesn't go up in flames. So my electrician buddy told me to get a grounding rod installed near the shed and he'll take care of the rest. <laughs> Easier said than done. Grounding rods are eight feet long, and where I live, there's a dormant volcano about 50 miles to the east of us, and thousands of years it decided to spew forth many volcanic rocks around these parts. So the soil here is dry, tough as nails, and there are guaranteed to be rocks throughout. The videos I watched on YouTube made it look easy, since they must not be dealing with rocky terrain like I am. But I used their same techniques, borrowing a demolition hammer with a driving rod bit on the end and forcing it down while also using a sledgehammer. The first four feet or so went fairly smoothly. It was still slow going, but at least it was going. But after four feet, the ground must have changed to dense clay, maybe? Because it suddenly became so taxing just to make a few inches of progress. Back and forth between the demo hammer and the sledgehammer and anything else, I tried to make it go down further. Then when it got to about a foot left to go, I must have ran into a gigantic boulder or something because progress became incredibly slow. Maybe an inch, an hour, if that. And at this point, the demo hammer wasn't doing anything whatsoever. So it was just a sledgehammer in me trying to drive that rod down. Just exhausting. But after persevering for two and a half days, yes, two and a half days swinging a sledgehammer, I finally got it down to where it needed to be. To this day, these joints right here on my hands still ache. I don't know who out there has played baseball, but you know when you hit the ball off the bat wrong, a real bell ringer, or the pressure waves of the impact surge back through your own body? Yeah, that happens a lot when you're trying to force a grounding rod through a boulder. The boulder fights back. And I honestly wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. Whew. So. Once the outlets had been fixed and panels had been grounded and bonded, the final touches could finally be made. A TV stand and a TV were brought in, all speakers were mounted, ear level speakers were put in place, speaker wires were cut and stripped, banana plugs put on, components hooked up with so many wires, and then it was time to power it all on. The moment of truth to see if it all worked. And it did. Thank goodness that was the case or else I probably would have had a mental breakdown. Remember how I said this theater almost broke me? Yeah, 
mentally and physically. Success. One main goal I had with the height speaker placement of this testing theater was to have RO3D in mind. If you read up on the science behind RO3D, you'll notice that they really went deep into psychoacoustics and binaural hearing and really wanted to emulate as best they could just how our brains perceive sound and the direction it's coming from. So their basis for height speaker placement is to keep them at about 30 degrees up from the listening position. So I got a little laser powered level, put it on a tripod to represent where my ears would be if I were sitting on a couch, then tried to find the sweet spot where 30 degrees would line up just about at the front and back corners of the room. It took some time to find 30 degrees for both the front and back in roughly the same spots, but I did eventually find it. So I marked on the floor and the walls where that sweet spot was so then I could mount the side heights on that same plane. But since the side walls are closer to me, 30 degrees ends up being lower down on the wall. Which is fine, I just needed to mark those locations and mount the speakers accordingly. Needless to say, I am very excited to test out RO3D upmixing in this space, especially with a killer Voice of God speaker straight up above me now. Hooray. Now, some of you may be wondering, Elin, why even build a dedicated home theater? Why not build out a nice testing living room like Andrew Robinson since that's going to be more realistic and more what like consumers are going to be enjoying because they're going to make their living room their home theater. If I could pull off a gorgeously lit and aesthetically pleasing living room space that looks straight out of a magazine like Andrew Robinson, believe me, I would. But there is one big factor that made me steer towards a dedicated home theater. The wife factor. Andrew Robinson has the luxury of having a wife who is also his business partner. So, like a superhero dynamic duo, they run the channel together. My wife teaches microbiology at the college here in town. And when it comes to audio, she doesn't give a shit. Like, at all. And when I first started this channel, testing various equipment and such, I had to take over the living room and or our master bedroom with wires everywhere and boxes and I beat boxes in every corner of the garage or every corner of the house that I could find. And let me tell you, she barely tolerated it. I mean, yeah, she knew it was all part of this line of work, but in the end, she was very annoyed by the whole situation. Hence the reason I almost killed myself just to build this theater mostly on my own. For the greater good. The greater good. I'm sure there are plenty of you out there watching this who can relate. Am I right? So I'd say it's a win-win. My wife is so happy that it's far away from the house, and I'm extremely happy because I get my own little sanctuary in which I can test and review anything to my heart's content. What exactly do we have in this setup, you ask? Let's do some roll call, shall we? This is my brother-in-law's already ancient 65-inch curved LG 3D 4K TV from 2016, but the picture still looks dope, so it does the job. And bringing picture to the TV is an LG UBK 94K Blu-ray player. Underneath that is the IOTA AVX 17 preamp, which I will be reviewing in my next video. So if you're not already subscribed, do it now. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. But once I have to send it back, my home base AVR will be my Marantz SR7015, which I will be running a 10.1 RO3D configuration on in preamp mode, baby. Below the AVX17 is the Outlaw Audio Model 7000X 7 channel external amp, which is powering most of my bed layer speakers. That review will also be coming soon, just FYI. To the left is the Emotiva Basics A7 7 channel amp, which powers all the height channels. Oh, maybe I should do a comparison of the Basics A7 and the Outlaw Model 7000X, you say? You better believe that's coming up too. Above that is the Peachtree Nova 300 Stereo Integrated Amp, which powers the monstrous Verus 3 V8T towers from Aperion Audio for most of my front soundstage. Both have already been reviewed if you're interested. Right next to the towers handling the low frequencies are two Aperion Audio Bravus 2 12D subwoofers. And completing the front soundstage is the Aperion Audio Verus 3 Grand V6C center channel. Front wides and voice of God above me are handled by the Aperion Audio Nova Slim N6SC LCR speakers. Surrounds are the Aperion Audio Verus 3 Grand V5B bookshelf speakers. Surround back duty is done by the Aperion Audio Novus N6T tower speakers. Front and rear height are the Aperion Audio A5 height modules. Middle heights are SVS Prime elevations. 
And last but not least, the center front height is an Emotiva Airmotive A1 height speaker. Now I know what you're thinking. You can't handle all those speakers at once. You are correct. But I wanted to have all those in place so I can easily switch between configurations for easy testing purposes. I would need like a Trinoff altitude preamp to power all those speakers simultaneously. But I'm not about to spend as much as a car just to pull that off. But I would love to get my hands on one to try it out if you're listening, Trinoff. Huh? But a million and a half thanks go out to Perian Audio for basically making this entire theater what it is today. I spent the better part of yesterday going through my favorite demo scenes like the Battle of Pelennor Fields from Return of the King, the tunnel shootout in John Wick 2, the intro to Blade Runner 2049, the intro to Mad Max Fury Road, and from some more recent purchases, the final race from Ford vs Ferrari and the ocean battle in Godzilla vs Kong. Another head-to-head -head matchup that I'll be reviewing soon is the IOTA AVX-17 preamp versus my Marantz SR7015 in preamp mode. Are preamps really that much better than AVRs with preouts? I know I'm late to the party, but I finally saw the newest Doctor Strange movie in theaters a couple days ago, but going through those demos yesterday, it honestly sounded like I brought the theater experience into this 11 by 16 foot space. Not joking. Everything I watched sounded the best I had ever heard it in a home setting. So again, you're going to want to make sure your notifications are on in the upcoming months now that I'll be pumping out videos more regularly with this space finally serving its purpose. Because I am very excited to share what I have in store for you this summer. But let me backtrack a bit. I think the most surprising factor was the overall bass response, and I have to give credit to those Bravas 212Ds carrying that load. I had never heard these subwoofers sound like this ever. In my initial review, I had some complaints about the overall versatility of them and the speed at which they were reacting to certain things on screen, etc. But now, there's one word that comes to mind. Articulation. What does that mean? Concerning movies, it means the ability to reproduce so many different kinds of bass response. Bass sweeps, whomp whomps, booms, bangs, thuds, the bottom end of lasers, shotgun blasts, you name it, the 12 Ds were giving it to me in full force. Well, why? Could it be the room itself, since I put the effort into acoustically treating it well? I mean, hell, I haven't even gone subwoofer crazy yet and run REW. All I did was run the room calibration software that comes with the IOTA AVX-17. Nothing crazy. When I first reviewed these subs, I was using my dated 9-channel Onkyo AVR, which has no pre-outs, so it was carrying a heavy load. So could it be that the Onkyo could only handle so much low-frequency processing? So my subs are only as good as my weakest link? And it's not until you have separates that subwoofers really get the shine? Let me tell you, these are questions I want answered too. Believe me. So please, come along on this journey with me and let's figure this shit out, shall we? And there you have it. Thank you so much for watching. Now it's your turn. My question to you is, where are you on your home theater journey? Are you running a soundbar system right now? A baseline 5.1.2 Dolby Atmos configuration? Are you thinking about taking the plunge into separates territory? Are you building your own dedicated home theater space? Let's start a conversation, people. As always, please be kind to each other out there. Don't just watch TV and movies, experience them. And of course, always be listening.